everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hello to everybody up in the balcony seats. Those are the expensive seats, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Lord, we thank you for the again for the day for uh, for just the amazing place to be and amazing place to draw near to each other and to draw near to you and the opportunity to do that. Let's pray that uh, you would overshadow whatever happens today as we as we teach your word. Keep me hidden behind the cross, uh, Lord. Just by the power of your Holy Spirit, let what comes out be what you want to be heard today. And uh, thank you in Jesus' name, Amen. So you know I'm honest with you guys, right? <laughs> and and uh, you know there's there's times when I'm just like I was in this all week and I was having trouble. I was feeling less than inspired. It seems like John rambles sometimes. In this. So you pick that up. What John puts down, what he writes to his people that are reading, is, is kind of like a plate of chow mein. It's all connected, but it's just all wrapped up and into each other. And he goes off here, and it comes back here. And, and I'm like trying to follow that. I'm like, man, I don't know. And it seems like, you know, and he's, as the chow mein noodles go around and double back on each other and come back, it's like, I've kind of heard this before. But he's, he repeats things because they're important. And uh, I, I think I, I felt really good about this when I, by the time I turned off the light at my desk and went upstairs last night, which means it's probably going to be terrible. So, <laughs> so by the power of the Holy Spirit today, uh, last week, and we're going to be in uh, 1 John chapter 4, if you have your Bible and you want to follow along. Last week, uh, John told his readers, which includes us now. You know, he's writing to a specific group of people, but we're also reading this 2,000 years down the road and, and uh, still benefiting from it. He told his readers not to believe everything you hear. Don't believe every spirit. Everything that comes along says, boom, this is the new manifestation from God. He says, don't believe it. It's like, test it. Test the spirits to make sure they actually are from God. Take everything that comes along the pipeline Measure it up against the template of Jesus. That will tell you it's, if it's from Jesus. If it looks like Jesus and it acts like Jesus, then it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a God thing. So take everything, measure it up against who Jesus is. Uh, he also said that we are from God. That's kind of nice. We are from God. And because of that, we have overcome the funky doctrines. We have overcome the funky teachings just by, by virtue of being from God. Uh, he said that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world, which we love because that means we don't need to be walking around in fear. Like every shadow is going to contain some bad teaching, some demon that's going to jump out and, and hit us or bite us or something. We don't have to live in that kind of fear. We've overcome. He who is in us is greater than he is than he was in the world, and we have overcome the funkiness, the teachings. We have overcome the world just by virtue of who we belong to. I love the freedom of that. So we don't have to live a life of fear. We don't have to, you know, fear doesn't stand a chance. See, that's why I wanted to do that song today. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to be good. Fear doesn't stand a chance. And then he said that there are those in the world who will only tune in to the frequency, the wavelength, the radio station of the world. There are only those in the world who will only listen to the world. And we shouldn't be surprised when those who are rooted in the world, who abide in the world, uh, tune us out. When we try and talk to them. We're supposed to have our hands open. We we extend a hand of grace to them. We talk to them. Uh, but we shouldn't be surprised when they don't listen to us. Sometimes because they're going to tune into what they want to hear. Sometimes what we have to say isn't what they want to hear. Uh, and so this is how we know the spirit of truth and tell it from the spirit of falsehood. So we pick it up today in chapter 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. So he's bringing it back to love. He's always bringing it back to love. We go off, don't believe the funky teachings, don't do this, do this, and love. We're going to bring it back to love now. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how he showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So, dear friends, my NIV says, some translations say beloved, which is probably a better translation. Literally in the Greek, it says, those who are loved, let us love. 
So it's like, y'all are loved. Those who are loved, let us love one another. Uh, love is not something we check off the list to earn God's favor, to earn the favor of other people. It's something we do just because we have to. Uh, that was Cain. Remember John talked about Cain a few weeks ago. And Cain was checking stuff off the list. And he brought his sacrifice. And it wasn't, God didn't like his sacrifice because it didn't come from here. It was just like checking stuff off the list. He was just being very superficial with it. He's being transactional with God. And God doesn't want us to be transactional with him. Uh, so he wants it to come from the heart. Uh, love isn't something we just do and go, I, I love today. I did this. It was loving. So, God, what's in it for me now? What are you going to give me? You know, and that, that's, not, that's not what it's all about. To response to what we have, and as those who are loved, who have been loved, who will be loved, it's our natural response is to be loving. The word love is used 42 times. I didn't go count it myself. I got this from a commentary, so I'm going to confess to you guys that I didn't go through and spend the time to count it personally, but it said 42 times this word love appears in 1 John. 32 times in this passage, right, that we're, that we're in the middle of right now. Uh, it's as though John is trying to say something to his readers. I, you know, and if we, if we pray about it and we're open, we might just receive what he's trying to say. You know, it's like he's trying to say something. Every time that word love occurs in this book, in this passage, all 42, 32 times in this passage, it's, it's agape love. It's not eros. It's not, hey, baby, how you doing, love? You know, kind of nice. It's not phileo. Hey, bro. My bro, hey. Chest bump. Yeah, bro love. It's, it's, not, it's agape love. Uh, it's the one that he's using here. The, the, the holy standard, the God standard, the gold standard of God kind of love. The love that just is. Love, agape love just is. It's love that doesn't flinch, that doesn't turn away, that doesn't run away. Uh, it's love that comes with its own sufficiency. It doesn't need conditions to be met before it exists, before it gives, before it extends itself. It just is. And that's the love that he brings up 42 times in this book, agape love. So those who were loved, let us love. Let us love one another. For love comes from God, he says. Uh, back in verse 6, and we saw this last week, he says that we come from God too. We come from God. Love comes from God. Essentially, everything comes from God. Right? Through Jesus, the, the logos, the word, the logic, the communicative idea of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything comes from God. It's all sourced from the same manufacturer. We, being from God, love, being from God, all sourced from the same manufacturer. And it all works best together with original parts. I couldn't go take, you know, an alternator off Dave's Lexus if mine goes bad and put it in my Subaru because it's not from the same manufacturer. It's different brands. It's different parts. So we and love all come from the same manufacturer. You know, when I first saw the Subaru Wilderness Edition, you guys seen that? Oh, oh man. I saw that. It's got like an extra inch or inch and a half of ground clearance on it. And when I first got my Outback, I'm like, we come out of the store, I'm like, look at the ground clearance on that thing. And then I saw these, and it's got like big old gnarly tires, and it sits even higher. I'm like, I need one of those. One. Uh, but I, you know, I don't have the money. So I'm like, I wonder if I could lift mine to make it higher like that. I go on Amazon. Yeah, there's there's part kits you can get to yeah, get that thing up in the air higher. And then I was reading about it. And, of course, then I have to buy that. And then I have to buy the really cool tires to go with it. It would be expensive. Not going to happen essentially. And then I was also reading that, that sometimes with these aftermarket parts, when you buy the aftermarket lift, it's harder on the axles, which Subarus have issues with those anyway. Those things wear out, you know, on the regular, and it kind of wears those out a little faster because it's not an original part. So sometimes to get a good result, you go back to the manufacturer, you get the actual factory authorized parts, and you get a better result, right? And that's the way it is with us. That's the way it is with love. In the system of Christian faith, it's best to use all authentic, genuine OEM manufacturer parts with ourselves, with our faith. And agape is the fullest culmination of all love. Uh, no matter what love you have, 
whether it's Eros, whether it's Phileo, Storge, you know, all those, those gloves that we talked about, they all get better when they are overshadowed under the umbrella of agape love. We can bring them into that sacrificial, self-existent, just is, going to give everything for you because I love you kind of love. It makes all love better. It comes from God. It can't be swapped out with lesser loves and get a good result. And we've tried. I look at the movie, we'll go to the movies and watch movies, and sometimes they're like trying to swap out agape with Eros. You know, it's, Eros is good. Hey, baby, how you doing? You look nice kind of love. It's good, but it's, you know, agape is better. And, and Eros won't function well on its own without the agape as that protective covering, that protective coating over it uh, that protects that love then from selfishness. Right. So people have tried to swap out the love. No, only agape love is, is the best one. Can't swap that out with lesser loves and get a good result. So John says, whoever has been born of God and knows God, uh, whoever has been born of God knows God, and whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Uh, so yeah, whoever has been born of God knows God. And am I getting that right? But I'm, I'm going to question, I am going to question my typing here. Yep, yep, yep. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, look at that. I'm like, man, that's, that seems kind of harsh. It sounds like if you don't know God, you don't, you don't have any love, right? Uh, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that if you're an atheist, or that if you're a Buddhist or anything else, that you are incapable of love. I'm not going to tell you that because I don't believe that. It's, you know, everybody's got that capacity of love. In fact, I have known some atheists, and I can think of examples right now, some atheists who have been better at loving people than some Christians that I can think of, right? So when I look at this, what I'm thinking is that the fingerprints of God are all over his creation. You look around us today, there are just object lessons about him everywhere. There's, there's air, there's light, there's trees, the flowers are coming back to life, and they're going to be blooming pretty soon. We'll have the bumblebees all over here. They're gentle. They're the panda bears of the bees. They're the okay ones. Uh, and then we're going to get the meat bees. Uh, I don't know about that. I think those are, I, I guess God created those for a reason. I don't know. To torment me. Yeah. They're mean. Yeah. And you know, all these lessons we have out here, the fingerprints of God are all over this place. That's why I love being out here this morning. I can, you know, point to the trees and the sky and photosynthesis and birds flying. There's object lessons about God everywhere. There's things that teach us about him. His fingerprints are all over his creation. And I think our capacity for love as human beings is part of this. We are made in the image of God. What we do with that, then it is up to us. And a lot of people take that image of God that we are created with, and they mess that up. They get into things that, you know, and the, the ultimate goal of the enemy is to take that family resemblance away. Right? You're born, you got this whole beautiful little baby, and the enemy's like, how am I going to get that person to turn away, to do ugly, bad things, to take away that family resemblance with God? You know, we're made in the image of God. Capacity of love is part of this. So the beauty of experiencing agape love is to understand where it comes from and how it works. I think everybody's got that capacity in them. Uh, there are people who routinely will put their lives at risk. You look at firefighters and law enforcement. They will put themselves at risk for the benefit of other people. That's like an agape level of love. Somebody who runs into the burning house instead of away from it to rescue people, to do good for humanity. That's an agape kind of love. I'm going to throw myself, I don't even know this person. I am going to put my life on the line to go save theirs. That's an agape kind of love. I think we all have that kind of wired in because we are made in the image of God. But the beauty of really experiencing that understanding where it comes from. If I were to sit down and, like, say I wanted to make a patchwork quilt, right? Those are cool. I've seen people who've made these. It, they're just amazing. If I want to sit down and make one, I might be able to, it, it'd be kind of funky, right? It wouldn't, probably wouldn't look like the good ones that you see at the craft shows. And, you know, grandma brings out this perfect square, perfectly sewn. Mine's going to be a little funky. It's like, don't, don't handle it too much. It might fall apart. 
it because I don't know how to do that. I might be, I might have a natural ability to be kind of good at making stuff like that, but I don't really know how. I might have to go through a process learning how to do that. And the best way is to go to somebody who really knows and understands what they're doing and learn from them. Take some lessons, you know. Or if you look at a masterpiece painting, we finally went it. I, I lived in Sacramento for 15 years, was up here for 10 or 15 years, and then uh, finally went to the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. I had never gone there when I lived there. And finally went to the Crocker Art Museum, and these, there's these Bierstadt paintings. Have you heard of that guy? These paintings, those old school 1800s pictures of Yosemite. He did these paintings in the light values, the shadow, the stuff he's able to do with a brush on a canvas is just phenomenal. And I could go up to that and go, I could sit right in front of it, and I could get the same paints he used, the same brushes, and the same kind of canvas, and try and recreate that brush stroke for brush stroke, and it's not going to look right. I'm, I'm fairly artistic. I can do okay. I can hold my own, but I don't think I'm going to be able to recreate what he did. Even Bob Ross, right? I'm not going to like tell you that Bob Ross is the same as a beer stat, but, but you know, Bob Ross... So it's like, oh, what's he doing? That's kind of weird. Oh, that looks kind of cool. And then, oh, maybe in our world, a little tree. <laughs> no, you just had it looking cool. What did you do? You, you know. And then he kind of does this thing with it, and and uh, comes out okay. And I love that that he walks you through. That you're sitting there and you start with a blank canvas and oh, with a little phthalo blue, yellow ochre, beat the devil out of the brush. You guys, you guys know Bob Ross, right? Anybody? If you don't. It's actually made a resurgence. You can watch them on, like, streaming networks now because it's just so relaxing to watch. He gets up there and beat the devil out of that brush. He's like, tick, tick, tick. I love it. Just, you know, he was, what is that, ASMR or AMSR or whatever, like the audio sensory thing where things just sound cool. You can find that on YouTube. We're all hot with the kids these days. And, uh, oh, just the sound of the brush on the canvas. And he walks you through. He starts with blank canvas. He walks you through. So you kind of have an understanding of how he gets to this end result. I love that. So, he, you know, you get to follow along with this creative process, gain the understanding of how it all works, how it all goes together. That's in the same way when we bring our natural abilities, our built-in fingerprint of God abilities for love, our capacity for agape love, when you bring that to the master painter, uh, to the creative mind behind our natural abilities to love, then you're going to gain a better understanding. You're going to gain a much better understanding. You're going to learn to paint better in the medium of agape love than you could before. So that's what I see in this. And then John takes it a level further, and he's like, God is love. And in case you didn't get that, or in case you thought he misspoke, in case you thought he stuttered, he's going to say it again next week. <laughs> Throw it out, God is love. Now, it's inter interesting to me that he didn't say love is God. You know, we get out here in nature, and people through history have worshipped all kinds of stuff in the creation, all kinds of creation apart from the creator. And I think that's where we get in trouble. You get people to worship the sun. You know, the Egyptians, they had Ra, the sun god. They worshipped the moon. They worshipped the druids, worshipped the trees, right? All this stuff you single out, it's like, we like this stuff. This is cool. We're going to worship this. But you're worshipping the product and not the source. You're worshipping the outworking, not the power behind the creative force behind the outworking. All good things. The sun, the moon, the trees, the earth, all good things. With the fingerprints of the divine on them, but none of them are God. And the same goes with love. Love is not God. God is love. Love apart from God is not God. Right? God is love. It's his creation. It's his idea. It is his song that he writes, it is his quilt, it is his masterpiece painting, his expression, his thought. To fully understand it, we need to go to him. So what does love look like in that context? I'm glad you asked because he's going to tell us. Verse 10. This is love. So this is love. <laughs> Not that we have loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. His love, and this is freeing and kind of scary. You know, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, where God's love is kind of out of control. We can't manufacture it. We can't force it. We can't create it. It just is because it's agape. Uh, not that God loved us or that, that we love God. No. Boy, don't single that and don't edit that out and put that on the internet. You know, I'll have, oh, heretic. Not that we love God, but God loved us. Our ability or inability to love God has no bearing on his love for us. There is freedom in that. There is security in that. And it's kind of scary because I like to be in control of what happens sometimes. I would like the idea of being in control of the love of God, being able to earn more by what I do. That puts me in the driver's seat. We are not in the driver's seat of this. We cannot manufacture. We cannot cause God to love us anymore. We cannot cause him to stop loving us. His love just is. He loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly care to die. But God demonstrated his own love. This is his love. This is his idea. His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't require anyone to level up before he would come do what he did, uh, to come up to a certain standard before he demonstrated this love for us. He didn't demand that we show some degree of loyalty, right? That it's like, you guys are messed up. You need to get at least here, and then I'll come. No, he didn't do that. While we were powerless, and it was his idea, he came and died for us while we were still sinners. Instead, boom. Love for you because you are beloved. Love for you and you and you and you and you and you and you. Love for you because because you are beloved. So Jesus put himself in human flesh. He was born. And everyone who was born, eventually, yeah, everyone who was born goes through death. And he didn't just go through death. He went through kind of a hard death, and he didn't just overcome death. He overcame death at the hands of religious corruption. He overcame death at the hands of a self-serving, power-hungry empire. He overcame death from those who should have known him and chose not to know him, chose not to recognize him. He overcame death from those who couldn't have had fewer rips to give about him. Do you think the Roman Empire cared? They were like all in their own head. They were like all in their own power, trying to trying to maintain control over empire. And there was all that, and there was the, there was our sin that had to be dealt with, right? So he took on a death that was about the most effectively humiliating and miserable experience that fallen humanity could think of to dish out. Uh, and he said, "Not today." He died, and he's like, nope, not today, Satan. And he came back from it, so death will not have the final word. Death will not have the final word with religious corruption. Death will not have the final word with empire. Death will not have the final word with our own sin and the own things we do in our lives that mar that family resemblance with God, that make the fingerprints of God on our lives look less evident. This should have been our Easter service. Oh, well, you know. Maybe someone needs a little Easter today. So, happy Easter. He is risen. This is love. As God loved us, so we ought to love each other. No one has seen God, but they see us. You see how that works? It's like, where is God? I don't see God anywhere in this situation. Look at the people. Right? And when we're doing our job, and we are like sitting down at the feet of the master painter and learning to work in the medium of agape love. And we start then using that to benefit other people. Then we are quite visible, right? God, use, he chooses, he could do it without us, but he chooses to incorporate us. He could do this without me. He could just like, you know, speak from heaven up here and 
probably do a much better job. But he chooses to involve me in this, which is just amazing. I love that. You know, this, I get to be part of this. You know, every morning we pray before we come up here, every Sunday morning. And I'm like, God, thank you that we get to do this. You know, it's, it's such a privilege to be able to do this. He chooses to use us. And when we show up and when we're, you know, working under his power and in his idea of love, then people see God. People see God working in us and through us. And he shows up and people can see that. And then when we do that, God's love has been perfected in us when we love each other. And perfected means complete. It's like filled up. Go to Starbucks. You you want room for cream? No. I want you to fill that thing up all the way so that it like kind of comes out and dribbles down the seam and gets my coffee. I don't want as full as you can get with the goodness of the coffee. Do not pollute my coffee with dairy. Don't leave any room for that. I want it full. That's complete. That's a complete cup of coffee. God's love is complete in us, full to the top. No room for fluff or dairy products, sugar. Just It's all there, just the concentrated, the actual thing, right, the pure thing. It's filled up, complete in us when we love each other. That's good news. So we're going to leave it there today. So you who are loved, you You who are loved, love one another. Love is from God. It's his creation. It's his idea. And to fully understand it and benefit from it, you have to go to the source. You have to go to the manufacturer. During the gold rush, a lot of people came here from the east. And they would stop off in Independence, Missouri. It was like their last resupply point before the wilderness got real. Before it got dry and hot and cold and rainy and snowy, all the stuff those guys had to go through. You know, they they stopped in Independence, Missouri on their way, but they didn't start digging there for gold, did they? It's like, well, this is good enough. Get the shovel. You know, and you can dig all day. They might have found some. There wasn't much. Um, They packed up. They kept moving to where the gold was. You know, there used to be a lot of gold in these higher hills. There still is. There still is. Um, You just have to go where it is. You have to know where to go get it, and then you have to go to where it is and get it. When I was at Columbia College, we went and did a little gold panning in Woods Creek that crosses right along the the entrance of Columbia College there. Went down, and I found out I suck at gold panning. (laughs) I'm not very good at it, because some of the guys, you know, the actual gold flex right there at Columbia College in Woods Creek, you know, and they got little flecks of gold. I thought that was amazing. You just have to know where it is, and you have to go get it. Gold is good, but gold is just a part of the creation, right? It's like the moon, the sun, the trees, the earth. Gold is just part of creation. If people would go to such great lengths and sacrifice to go where they could find a shiny yellow metal, uh, how, where will we go in order to find love at the source? Right? And the good news is we don't have to go very far. We don't have to pack up our wagons and go across the country and, you know, and we get tired and, you know, the animals start to die and we got to start throwing stuff off the wagon because there's not enough to pull it. It was hard. It was hard for those guys. Look up the Bartleston Bidwell party. If you haven't seen that story, they came up over what is now some hour pass. And, oh, man, the stuff that they, you know, can you imagine? It's hard enough in a car. I get scared in a car going over Sonora Pass, going down the other side. Please, God, let the brakes hold up today. And uh, get down to the bottom. You can smell hot brakes. And I, I can't imagine doing that in a wagon, a covered wagon. And so so people would do that, you know, to come for new opportunity to find a shiny yellow metal. We don't have to do that to get to the source, to get to the manufacturer with God. All we got to do is go to him. And, you know, he's going to be there. Let's sit down with a master painter this week.